Hey fellow lab rats, this is Rebecca from the Lab Rat YouTube channel. In this video, I'm going to be discussing vitamins and trace minerals for our clinical chemistry lecture series. Okay, let's get started. Many different analyses were performed for assessing a patient's nutritional status. A clinical exam by the patient's physician or healthcare provider is the important first step. Analysis of the patient's dietary habits by a registered dietitian can also be performed. The patient's environment may also be assessed, including their ability to purchase and prepare their food. Body mass index, or BMI, and bone density of the patient can also be evalu evaluated. Lastly, a biochemical analysis of vitamins and minerals may be performed. The laboratory plays an essential role in this piece of the nutritional assessment of patients. Prealbumin, also called transthyretin, is a protein that is produced in the liver. It is responsible for helping to transport thyroid hormones and vitamin A throughout the bloodstream, and also helps to regulate how the body uses energy. So prealbumin has a two-day half-life. So recall, half-life is the time it takes for the amount uh, of substance to decay by half in the body. So a two-day half-life. Regular albumin has a half-life of 20 days. So if somebody becomes malnourished, because the prealbumin has a shorter half-life, meaning it will be eliminated from the body quicker than albumin, the prealbumin level will be lower than the albumin level. So this is why prealbumin is the best indicator of protein status for patients. If a patient has a prealbumin level that is greater than 180 milligrams per deciliter, this is a normal nutritional balance. Less than 80 indicates a severe protein malnutrition in the patient. Vitamins are molecules that are required in small amounts of the normal functioning for the normal functioning of the human body. Vitamins are divided into their solubility classes, fat soluble and water soluble vitamins. Fat soluble vitamins are absorbed in the intestinal tract with fat and are stored in the body's tissues. If large amounts of these vitamins are taken, they can lead to a toxic buildup. The, the fat soluble vitamins are vitamin A, vitamin D, vitamin E, and vitamin K. Water soluble vitamins are obviously soluble in water and can be excreted in the urine. Because of their ability to be excreted in the urine, they are not often attributed to toxic levels within the body. Over the course of this lecture, we're going to discuss all of these vitamins. However, I made this chart for you for ease of memorization. You do need to know this chart, including the common and chemical names of each vitamin and whether it is fat or water soluble. There's really not an easy way to remember this chart other than just rogue memorization. However, in terms of solubility, I do recommend that you just remember that the fat soluble vitamins are vitamin A, D, E, and K. And if it's not one of those vitamins, you know that it is water soluble. So definitely know everything on this chart. And like I said, we're going to be discussing these in detail in the coming slides. There are a variety of at-risk patients uh, for becoming deficient in vitamins. Neonates, so newborn babies, and the elderly are at more risk uh, for deficiencies. Pregnant women or those taking oral, contraception, oral contraceptives also are at risk. The fetus in pregnant women uses a lot of resources from the mother, so this makes sense. And some birth control pills have been shown to deplete some vitamins. Incoming immigrants from developing countries can also be depleted of vitamins uh, due to improper nutrients in food. And when I say this, I'm talking about in the United States. Uh, patients who are strict dieters who are not eating a balanced meal can also be vitamin deficient. Chronic drug users and alcoholics have a tendency to be deficient in vitamins as well. Patients on kidney dialysis and also patients who are receiving nutritional support. These are people, for whatever reason, um, are unable to eat and are given something called total parenteral nutrition, or TPN, and this is given via an IV, so intravenously. So this bypasses the gastrointestinal tract and requires additional supplements if, is, if it is used for a long period of time. 
So on a previous slide, I believe it was two slides ago, recall that vitamin chart that I made for you. And one of those columns on it is the vitamin solubility, a vitamin solubility classification. Again, I would strongly recommend just remembering that the fat soluble vitamins are A, D, E, and K, and everything else is water soluble. But what does fat versus water solubility even mean in the first place? So the fat soluble vitamins are those that are absorbed by the body from the gut with the fats. They are then stored in the body's tissues and liver. Because of this, fat soluble vitamins can stay in the body for an extended period of time, actually up to six months, for availability for the body to use. Water soluble vitamins are not stored within the body. They enter the bloodstream, are used by the body for whatever it needs, and then the excess water soluble vitamins are excreted in the urine. And since these vitamins do not last long in the body, these are the ones that need to be replenished more frequently. All right, so let's get started on talking about these uh, vitamins. Vitamin A, or retinol, is a fat-soluble vitamin in plants and animals that has a variety of different functions. It is important for visual pigments, the immune system, and the differentiation of epithelial tissue. A deficiency of retinol can cause night blindness as well as complete blindness. Because retinol is a fat-soluble vitamin, if taken in large quantities, it can cause toxicity. Patients with vitamin A toxicity may have damage to their livers, be lethargic, and have uh, skin that starts to peel. Vitamin D, or cholecalciferol, is a fat-soluble vitamin that helps the absorption of calcium and phosphorus in the gastrointestinal tract. It helps the immune system and is essential for the mineralization of bones. When children have a deficiency of vitamin D, it causes a condition called rickets. When adults have a deficiency of vitamin D, it can cause softening of the bones called osteomalacia. Both of these conditions are associated with an increased risk of cancer, hypertension, diabetes, cardiovascular issues, and neurological problems. Vitamin E, or tocopherol, is a fat-soluble vitamin that serves primarily as an antioxidant. It also helps with cell-mediated immunity and protects membranes of axons and the red blood cells. A deficiency of vitamin E leads to a decreased life of a red blood cell, leading to hemolytic anemia. And uh, I will talk more about hemolytic anemia in my hematology lectures. Vitamin K, or phyloquinone, is a fat-soluble vitamin that is necessary for the synthesis of coagulation factors 2, 7, 9, and 10. A deficiency of vitamin K causes patients to have a tendency to bleed and have abnormally long prothrombin times or PT tests. Uh, so uh, pro times, so PTs, uh, are discussed in detail in the hematology lectures. Uh, but if you if you have seen these lectures, uh, recall that uh, the PT test is a test to determine how quickly the blood coagulates. In short, it's, it's a very broad summation of it. B-complex vitamins are a class of vitamins that primarily function as coenzymes involved in the metabolism of nutrients. They are commonly in whole grains, yeast, and also in liver. So having these sources in your diet is a good thing to help to replenish those B-complex vitamins. So these are not vitamins A, D, E, and K. So those are fat-soluble vitamins. B-complex vitamins are water-soluble, and thereby toxicity is very rarely seen uh, because excess quantities of these vitamins are excreted in the urine, which we've already talked about. Vitamin B1, or thiamine, acts as a coenzyme in glucose metabolism. It is also an important vitamin in the structure of nerve membranes. Chronic deficiencies in vitamin B1 cause a disorder called beriberi. Deficiencies of this vitamin in underdeveloped countries are usually due to poor diet. Alcoholism and cancer are leading causes of thiamine deficiencies in the United States. So beriberi, which of course is the disorder that is caused by a deficiency of uh, vitamin B1, uh, affects the nervous and cardiovascular systems of the body. Patients with this disorder can be depressed, have cognition and memory problems, and have poor coordination. Vitamin B2, or riboflavin, is a coenzyme in oxidation reduction reactions. A deficiency of riboflavin is caused by a reduced dietary intake due to alcoholism or malabsorption. 
Deficiencies of this vitamin can cause inflammation of the tongue and mouth and can cause cracked and dry skin at the corners of the patient's mouth. Vitamin B6, or pyridoxine, is a vitamin that serves as a coenzyme of the production of dopamine and serotonin. It's also needed for the production of heme molecules and porphyrins. So you'll learn about heme and porphyrins in uh, my hematology lectures. Typically, patients that have a deficiency of vitamin B6 also have other B vitamin deficiencies. Vitamin B12, or cobalamin, uh, functions as a coenzyme for the production of red blood cells. Patients that have a deficiency of vitamin B12 have megaloblastic anemia or pernicious anemia. In this anemia, the patient will have an increase of larger macrocytic red blood cells in the peripheral bloodstream. And uh, this is another topic that I'll talk more in detail in my hematology lectures. Uh, vitamin B12 is found primarily in animal products and is not present in plants. Vegetarian or vegan dieters may be deficient in vitamin B12. Folate or folic acid is important for the growth and division of cells, the production of red blood cells in DNA, and helps to prevent neural tube defects in babies in utero. Folate deficiency is currently the most common vitamin deficiency. Uh, patients with a deficiency of folate may experience atypical division of cells, megaloblastic anemia, and can experience an elevation um, in levels of homocysteine. And recall we talked about homocysteine in my enzymes and cardiac uh, marker lectures. If you haven't checked that out, please go um, visit that video. Vitamin B3, or niacin, or nicotinic acid, is a component of coenzymes NAD and NADP, which is utilized in several reactions in the human body. A deficiency of niacin can cause a disorder called pellagra. And pellagra is characterized by three main symptoms, and we call these the three Ds because the symptoms are diarrhea, which starts with a D, dementia, which again starts with a D, and dermatitis, which also starts with a D, so the three Ds. So as of now, there are no ways of assessing niacin values in the clinical laboratory. Vitamin C, or exorbic acid, is acquired from fruits and vegetables in a patient's diet. It's most commonly associated with oranges, which I have pictures of here on the right-hand side of the slide. Uh, it acts as an antioxidant and helps with the formation of collagen fibers. Scurvy is a disorder that is caused by a deficiency of vitamin C vitamins. Symptoms include bleeding, anemia, and impaired healing of wounds. All right, so those are the vitamins. Now we can talk a little bit about trace minerals. So trace minerals are inorganic elements that are needed in small amounts for normal functioning of the human body. These include copper, zinc, selenium, and iron. In the following slides, we'll be talking about these uh, trace minerals. Copper is found as copper 2 plus in tissues. Copper is needed for nerve impulse conduction and is a component of cytochrome oxidase, which helps produce energy intracellularly. Small amounts of copper exist freely in the body, but the majority of copper is bound to ceruloplasmin in the plasma. Patients with deficiencies of copper are usually due to malabsorption. Patients can also be copper deficient with nephrotic syndrome and those with a genetic disorder called Menke's disease, which interferes in the metabolism of copper. Now, if you've already had uh, urinalysis class, uh, you have um, heard about nephrotic syndrome. And take a minute here just to think about what, uh, what we see in the um, sediment of uh, urine in people that have nephrotic sy syndrome. Do you remember? It's actually oval fat bodies, so hopefully you got that right. If not, check out those urinalysis lectures again. Zinc is used by the body for various important enzymes. It helps to support vision, taste, and smell. Zinc is also essential for immunological reactions and wound healing within the body. Patients with a deficiency of zinc can experience a delay in growth, infertility, and experience hair loss. Now, magnesium is the second most abundant intracellular cation, just after potassium. So what does this mean when I say an intracellular? So it means that it's inside the cells. So the body needs magnesium for a variety of different functions, including serving as a cofactor in many various metabolic reactions within the body. 
Selenium is a non-metal uh, trace mineral that is a cofactor to an enzyme called glutathione peroxidase, which neutralizes free radicals in the body. Selenium is also thought to help prevent cancer and improve fertility and immunological responses. Patients with a deficiency of selenium have an increased risk of cancer, may have a low sperm count, and have an increased susceptibility to miscarriages and pregnancy. Iron is the most abundant trace mineral found in the human body. It is present in virtually every cell in the body and functions for the transport of oxygen molecules. A large majority of iron, so I'm talking about around 70%, uh, is found within the heme molecule of hemoglobin, which is in the red blood cell. Uh, so you'll learn more about that in the hematology lectures. A large, uh, sorry, I'm sorry, the, so the, the rest, so the, the large majority is 70% of it. Now the rest of the iron in the body is found in storage forms. When it's stored in uh, the serum uh, iron, uh, it's bound to transferrin and it's called ferritin. So the storage form of iron is ferritin uh, when it is uh, bound to transferrin. When it's stored in macrophages, it's called hemosiderin. So anytime you, you see uh, hemosiderin or you see ferritin, you wanna associate that with iron. Patients can have a deficiency of iron or an overabundance of iron. So those with not enough iron can experience fatigue and paleness. They will also have microcytic hypochromic anemia. Uh, so the red blood cell indices in patients with microcytic hypochromic anemia um, will have a decreased uh, mean cell volume or MCV and a decreased mean corpuscular hemoglobin concentration or MCHC on their complete blood count test. Now, if you don't know what, what in the world I'm talking about with MCV and MCHC, Check out my red blood cell indice video um, uh, here on this channel. Uh, this is a hematology concept and topic. Patients with too much iron run the risk of damage to their livers as well as heart attacks and diabetes. Too much iron present can be the result of a genetic cause such as sickle cell disease and hemochromatosis. It can also uh, be caused by too many blood transfusions and an excessive use of iron supplements. There are two ways that a patient with iron overload can be treated. If the hemoglobin and hematocrit of the patient is too elevated, therapeutic phlebotomy can be performed. Uh, therapeutic phlebotomy occurs when a certain amount of blood is taken from the patient and then discarded. If the patient has, of course, too much iron and has a normal hemoglobin and hematocrit, an iron chelator can be given to reduce the amount of, uh, amount of iron present within the blood. All right, so that ends the lecture on vitamins and trace minerals. If this video helped you, go ahead and give it a like. And of course, remember to subscribe to my channel for more educational laboratory content. And as always, if you have any questions specific to this lecture or uh, want to give me suggestions on other topics that I can cover on this channel, please leave those in the comments below. Until next time.